Just let time take time and you'll begin to feel the world is different. As a boy growing up in Scotland, John Swinton decided he wasn't very interested in becoming a Christian minister like his father was. So when he grew up, he became a nurse instead, working closely with people with intellectual disabilities. And the experience began to change him in profound ways. If you've ever spent any time with somebody with a profound intellectual disability or somebody with advanced dementia, then you know that you need to slow down and find that space to be with somebody. And when you do that, interesting things happen. Interesting things like coming to experience time itself in completely new ways. Across cultures, people understand time differently. So people walk faster in Manhattan than they do in Guatemala. And so the space that you inhabit in the world actually determines the way that you use time. Swinton decided to go back to the university to earn an advanced degree in theology. And he brought his experience with disability and curiosity about time with him. And now he's spreading a message about it far and wide. A minister after all. Yeah. Welcome back to Fireside with Blair Hodges. In this episode, John Swinton talks to us about his path-breaking book, Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. He takes us through a brief history of time, how Western culture has changed its experience of time in big ways, and how those changes have impacted people with intellectual disabilities, brain trauma, and people with conditions like dementia. And Swinton tells the story through the lens of a Christian theologian. Jesus walked at three miles an hour. So Jesus, who is God, who is love, walks at three miles per hour. So love has its speed and its slow speed. There's something very powerful about that. Love has its speed and its slow. This is episode eight, Slow Down. John Swinton, thanks for joining us at Fireside today. It's a pleasure, Blair. Nice to see you. Yeah, we're talking about your book, Becoming Friends of Time disability, timefulness, and gentle discipleship. And there aren't a lot of books about theology and disability. Yours is one of the few. It feels like they're picking up. We're starting to see more and more of that. But how did you get interested in writing about theology and disability together? Well, my, my background's in nursing, Blair, so I, I spent most of my early years working with people with mental health challenges and also people with intellectual disabilities. So I spent about 16 years working in these fields. And so when I came into theology, it was a natural place for me to reflect upon. So there's a lot of really interesting work going on there. So I'm encouraged for the future. And your work in theology, is that rooted in your own background, your own religion? Do you, does you find that to be a very religious pursuit? Yeah, well, I'm a theologian now, so therefore it's inevitably based in Christian theology. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with that because that's the spiritual route that I've taken over the years. And, you know, it's, it's interesting thinking back because my father was a, a minister. So he was a parish minister who moved to, to take up a chaplaincy position. And uh, so I, all my life I'd been kind of around churches, like, and I really found them really boring. <laughs> and excuse me, well, because if, if, like, like, if your father's a minister and you're forced to go to church and then you get into trouble when you come back home again, like, it's, it's not a good place to begin. So I was a slow starter when it came to, to religion. But uh, when I came in my mid-twenties, I began to think about it. And I began to take my own tradition a lot more seriously. And so that's, that's how I, I came into that. And then when I left nursing, I just felt that it was moving into theology was the right thing for me to do. And I think it's turned out to be the right thing for me to do. All right. Well, this book talks a lot about time. And I wondered, as I was reading this, I kind of got a little time obsessed. You <laughs> walk us through the history of time and like how people thought about time. And I felt like the clock started ticking louder. I was noticing more time. Did you feel that way as you were researching I time? I did. Because, well, the time's invisible. You know, it's like it rules our lives, but you don't really see it. Yeah. You know, because I mean, I, I opened up the book by saying like how many clocks I've seen that day. And I, I was writing that chapter about probably at half past nine in the morning. And I'd already seen about 10 or 12 clocks that like, guided me from my bed to my car to, to my office at work. And so it, it kind of hums along under the hood. But then when you notice it, you, you begin to see how unusual it is. We are so tied to time and so tied to time structures and so tied to being at particular places at particular times and allowing this little clicking thing in your watch or your digital clock or whatever it is to determine pretty much every inch of your day. And so when I noticed that, then that's when I became interested in time. It stopped being invisible. 
same as a reader. That's I had the same experience and even setting up this interview. I mean, we were in different time zones and so we had to go back and forth and like try, I, I'm I'm feel like I'm kind of time zone blind. Like I have difficulties <laughs> reckoning with exactly. that. Exactly. And I, I've been useless in setting up these meetings because I <laughs> although I, I write a book on time, I'm, I'm chronologically challenged. Like I'm constantly forgetting to put yeah. things in my diary or, or putting them in at the wrong time. Or if you if you add the added layer of complexity, put them in the wrong time zone. Yeah. Even even on a micro scale, like because we're so far away, there's a little bit of a delay in the discussion that I'm not used to. And so yeah. even just like in the in the moment, listeners won't pick up on it because the audio will be synced differently. But even mm. in the moment for us, time can make a big difference in how communication works in general. It certainly makes a difference to how jokes work. <laughs> yeah. If I say I'm it clever, does. you don't laugh and then you do laugh. So <laughs> kind of spoils it yeah, <laughs> yeah, I feel that. I feel that. So another word that you use in your introduction for time is mysterious. Yeah. What do you think about that? Time as a mystery. I don't think it's mysterious in the sense that most of us don't really know what it is. It, it comes and it goes and we move in it and we move towards whatever it is we move towards. But when you try to analyze it and break it down, it becomes more complicated for the average person. I imagine if you're a, a clever physicist or a really clever philosopher, it's much easier to conceptualize and bring it down. For, but for most of us, we just live there. It's just the air that we breathe. And for most of us, we don't want to break it down. You know, mm -mm. one of the things for modern people is the temptation that you're always trying to break down mysteries or turn them into puzzles and then solve them. Like, but there's something quite nice about just dwelling in time and just you know making the best of the time that you have without trying to work out what it actually is because it exists in all of our minds in the sense that we all know that's happened. You know, the older you get, the more aware you are of time. And interestingly, the more older you get the faster time seems to move. Mm. Now, I don't know whether that's just because you notice it more because you look at your face, particularly in an age of Zoom where you look at your face every day. Yeah. From all day. That's right. <laughs> whether you're more aware of it when you get older. And COVID obviously has changed time too. Oh, exactly. The way that we experience it. Yeah, COVID has had an impact on time because it slowed us all down, but not in a positive way. Yeah. You know, because if, if you think of, you know, culturally, I'm saying us, but I mean, Western culture, we're, we're very fast. We're moving towards the next thing. And mm -hmm. you, know, you can hardly have time to concentrate on what you're doing because you're always thinking about the future. But lockdown stops up and it stops you dead. And suddenly you don't have deadlines. You don't have work to go to sometimes. You know, within a capitalist society like our own, work is a form of spirituality. You know, if you think spirituality is these big questions, who am I, where do I come from, where am I going to and why, then work fulfills all of these things. Hmm. So you stop that work, and that's a problem for people that are retiring as well and, and unemployed, stop that, and these big questions don't have an answer. And so you have an existential spiritual crisis. And I think a lot of people have found that with lockdown, when you're stopped and trapped, then you have these big questions, who am I, where do I come from, where am I going to, and why, just rattle around your head because it's not sure what that is. Other people have loved it. But for some people, it's clearly a problem. Yeah, this is a strength of theology. And this is kind of what Fireside is about, is looking at how these religious ideas actually intersect with every aspect of our lives, mm -hmm. even people that don't necessarily consider themselves religious. And so when you talk about mystery, I think that's a strength that theology and theological thinking can bring to everyday life because there's a sense of humility there. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of living in a faithful way. So in other words, like not seeing everything, not knowing everything, yeah. but living according to certain ideas and beliefs. And so to think about the mystery of time, I think it's a real strength of your book to yeah. uh, to bring theology into conversation mm -hmm. with it. So mm -hmm. yeah, let's dig into it here. So in chapter one, thinking about time, your book, as we said, is a theological investigation. So you're looking at how beliefs about God come together with beliefs about time. So we'll start by going really far back in time, even before the invention of the clock as we know it today, before what we might call clock time. Just give us a, a little description about how people lived in time because your book shows it's pretty different than what we're used to today. If you can imagine for a second a world without clocks or without, without timekeeping machines, how would you work it out? How would you work out your way your day runs? Well, you'd work it out because your day would revolve around the sun rising, uh, it would revolve around the sun going down. It would revolve around the seasons and the way that the days extend or the days shrink, depending on the way that you 
uh, impacts upon your farming or your hunting or whatever it is. And so you would be much more embedded in time because time wouldn't be something that you can fragment in the way that a watch or a clock fragments it and breaks it up into minutes and hours. It would simply be there, something that you live into. And I don't mean that necessarily in a, a romantic way because it's it probably a very hard way of living, mm -hmm. but you live into time in a quite different way. Uh, and you'd be much more attuned to creation and the, the, your relationship with creation and to, as the seasons move, so your passage of your life moves with the seasons. But it'd be much more stable because there would be a, perhaps no long-term plans because you wouldn't necessarily know anything beyond the hedge that marks out the end of your property or your life. So you live in a relatively small, small world. You don't have the kind of long-term career ambitions because you're quite happy doing the things that you do and, and moving with the season. So it'd be a very different way of, of living. It's the kind of thing that many people would like to retire into. Like. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't sound too bad sometimes. But then you point out there are some religious roots of timekeeping more formally. So, like hours and minutes, you talk about how these have some religious roots with religious people starting to try to block out time. Well, yeah, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, the mechanical clock came into existence through the Benedictine monasteries. In the monasteries, the days split up into different spiritual segments. At particular moments in each day, you do a particular spiritual practice. Now you have to work out how to do that. You can do it with a sundial or you can do it with somebody who has a good memory and can kind of work out roughly how the day runs. Uh, but the way in which they began to deal with that issue is they developed a mechanical clock. But the original mechanical clock didn't have any hands. So it was simply chime bells at the precise moment when this particular spiritual practice had to go. So it was a, a handless clock that had a purely spiritual intention, which was to mark out the day as a spiritual thing. Uh, and then as time moves on, it's funny when you start speaking about time, you see it's, it's, you're always just blind. <laughs> it's it's all the time. It's always, it's so as time goes on, the first handed clock, if you like, only had one hand, which just moved around and again, marking out that spirituality of the day. So the key thing there is that these clocks had spiritual intention. They weren't there to make money in the way that we do. They were purely devotion to God. But when that mechanical clock leaked out into society, as it inevitably would do, and then came into contact with the emerging economic system, the beginnings of capitalism, that, that way of, of doing commerce, some clever people in Europe created the second hand. And so now you have a time beginning to be divided up into smaller segments. And then ultimately the, the third hand, if you like, for seconds, so you get minute hand and then the second hand. And so time begins to be fragmented in that way. Now the difference between that fragmented two-handed, maybe three-handed clock is that it was to make money. So that the day was different. Now you could be punctual for something because you had to be at a certain place at a certain point, not for spiritual purposes, but because you need to make money. You need to make this appointment. And so the emergence of that clock time, that industrial time, um, moves out of the monastery and then reveals itself in a different way in uh, what we would call nowadays European uh, average, average European time of whatever it may be called. Yeah, standard average European time you talk about in the book and yeah. you name the characteristics there that it's it's linear, you can lay it out, uh, it's dynamics, it's, it's, it's always moving, it's forward facing, time marches on, we can measure it and block it out and that makes it sellable, that makes it marketable, right. that makes it so we can like block out our lives in particular ways and that makes it feel, you say, it makes it feel like it's also controllable in a sense. Yeah. Obviously we can't control it in the sense of stopping it but we can control it in the sense of how we choose to apportion it out mm -hmm. on a smaller scale than maybe what people in the past did. Yeah, I think that's right. And we do have a control over time in the sense that if you're a manager, you have control over the time of, of your particular unit. You have control over the time of everybody that works in that unit. And so time becomes, first of all, a commodity, something that's bought and sold in the marketplace in the same way as you buy and sell cornflakes or Snickers bars or whatever it is. I don't know what American people eat, but we eat cornflakes. Yes, yeah, Snickers is good. <laughs> <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh. <laughs> well, <that's new. laughs> okay. And, and so, so it's commodified in that way. But, yeah. but it's also, I mean, you can't control time, but you can control time within the space that you are. 
Uh, but interestingly, uh, in terms of your spiritual day, you see that the same thing moving into people's spiritualities, where you know you have to mark out time for spiritual practices mm. or quiet time with God, as if these fragmented pieces of time are the only times when you can actually find space for God. And maybe they are, but that's a big difference between the way the Benedictines thought about it and the way that we think about time today. Mm. We're talking with John Swinton today. He's a Scottish theologian. We're talking about his book, Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. And I should mention as well, John is chair in Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen. We're really glad to be talking about this book. So that kind of gives us a sense of chapter one, and people can check that out. There's, there's a lot more information there than we were able to cover here. But chapter two connects up with the disability question. So it begins with this line that I'll read. It says, the connection between time and disability isn't obvious, but when we come to see it, it becomes disturbing and yet deeply enlightening. How did you first start to even think of that connection? You mentioned you had worked with people with disabilities. Is that where? It is. That's when I began to think about it. When I began working with people with intellectual disabilities, the term that was used then was mental defective. Then a few years later, it was mental handicap. Then a few years later, it was learning disability and now it's intellectual disability. All of these things shift and change, not because anything medical shifts and change, but because our attitudes and values shift and change. So mm -hmm. that's what made me think about it. And then when you trace back the history of a term like handicap, you know, it comes originally from horse racing, where you would handicap, you know, I'd put extra weights on a, 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 a horse that was a bit faster than the rest of the horses just to even up the odds. But then it leaks out into society and people try to use it or t do use it in different ways. So you're handicapped, you're bearing too much weight, you're slowed down, you're held back in that way. And you're defective, of course. It doesn't take too much imagination to work out what that means. Why are you defective? Well, you're defective because you don't have the intellect and ability to move quickly, to think quickly, to engage in the kind of industrial time that we value historically and contemporarily. And so the way that you name something describes what you think you're looking at. And what you think you're looking at really influences how you respond to what you think you look at. So these names are really, really important. And it's just that tie-in with time that seemed to me particularly important because people were speaking people with disabilities into existence in a quite particular way. And that was deeply tied into time. Right. So I studied at Georgetown a little bit of disability studies, and this is what scholars would call the social construction of disability. The idea that, yes, there are physiological things uh, with disabilities, mm -hmm. but the way that societies and people understand those disabilities is a construction. It's, yeah. it's a creation. It's something that's imagined and formed. And so it's interesting that you trace that language that it, you know, it used to be called an affliction or thought of as an affliction. And then it started getting tied into these time concepts. And nobody, I don't think, did this deliberately. They didn't sit down and say, yeah. all right, we need to tie this with the concept of time. It just made sense, the kind of yeah. ways they were dealing and knowing people with disabilities. So another word that, that I didn't hear you mention, and I'm curious, maybe this is an American term, but retardation is another word. And yeah, exactly. obviously, like to retard time is to slow it. Like it's explicitly a time term that was used. That is, that's right. And it's certainly one that's been used in the, in the United Kingdom and in Europe. So yes and they're all to do with pulling back holding back not being able to go fast enough mm -hmm. for the way that society yeah. wants you to do and it's just fascinating when you when you begin to analyze that kind of language which is the, the essence of what stigma is stigma is all about placing negative language on people and that the, the negativity comes from culture and so yet yeah, the idea of this, the social construction of disability is important so think about th th this way so somebody who lives with uh, down syndrome Okay, um, they're considered to be, or were considered to be, to have a mental handicap or a mental deficiency or whatever it is. But what's the problem with having the, uh, Down syndrome? The answer is nothing. Unless you live in a, a society that values intellect and reason and speed and quick thinking over relationships, community, friendship and love. And so the problem for people who live with Down syndrome is not Down syndrome, it's the context within which they're experiencing that. And, and that's, 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 that's why if we're thinking about overcoming stigma and thinking about inclusive communities, we need to think beyond looking at the individual, look at the culture, look at the community. That's where the change needs to happen. As I studied intellectual disabilities in particular, uh, 
I also thought about how I like who I am and I like how I think. And so I would see someone with Down syndrome and, you know, they're maybe not going and getting PhDs or not doing the same kind of things that I like. And so there's also kind of a comparative impulse I feel like I have where, and, and this is difficult to ask, basically to say, I wouldn't want to, to have those types of limitations or those type of, I wouldn't, you know, what are your thoughts about that? That kind of personal discomfort that people have? Well, the problem there is projection. And this is why people say, you know, people with the stick with Down syndrome, people with Down syndrome suffer. And you think, well, why do they suffer? And what, what happens and what you're pushing into there is people look at somebody who is different and say, oh, I wouldn't like to be like that. And so therefore you must be suffering. But that's your problem. <laughs> it's not their problem. <laughs> okay, you wouldn't like to be like that. That's because you're looking at that individual through a narrative of loss. Hmm. Whereas they're looking at themselves, their narrative of being. Mm. Uh, and so you're imagining, if that was me, I'd feel like this. And you've no idea whether you would or wouldn't. Like, just two different stories that are clashing in there. Mm. And I think if you hold on to the narrative of being and stop pushing yourself onto other people's, then you begin to see things differently. You get into some difficult conversations here in this chapter. You bring up humanism, a really strong regard for life, valuing human life, compassion and health and so on. And humanism sounds on the surface like a really good thing and has many good things about it. But you also show that it can have an underside. It can actually turn into a deadly ideology as well. Um, you bring up, for example, eugenics and euthanasia type things. Yeah, human rights and, and rights in general are really important. So there's no question about that. I mean, we need that in the kind of world that we live in. We need to have mm. strong legal structures to enable justice and fairness and peace. However, rights can be turned on individuals. If you, you may have the right to be protected by the law under certain circumstances, not to be discriminated against, but you may also have the right to live in a society where your condition is so stigmatized that in principle, you have the right to approach the authorities to have your life taken away. So take, for example, the issue of dementia in, in certain parts of Europe. When you have a diagnosis of dementia, you can go to your general practitioner or your family practitioner and ask to be euthanized. And if that doctor says, no, you can find another one that does it. And so eventually you, you will be able to have that experience. Now, why, why is it that people may be so terrified when they get that diagnosis? Not because of the way they're feeling, but because they project into the future, uh, a possible future that they, they consider to be awful. And so therefore that right to do that becomes something that's profoundly important for them, but difficult for family and friends, because this person may be just not in a, a situation where it's obvious that that should happen. And also there's some really interesting research just now, oh, just sticking with that issue, on the impact of euthanasia on doctors. And it seems to, that there's uh, some evidence that doctors are encountering post-traumatic stress disorder because or probably moral injury, I suspect, because that's not what doctors do. That's not what they're trained to do. And yet they have to do this in a clinical context and there's a price to be paid for that. So the clash of rights is, is something we always need to keep an eye on without in any sense saying that rights are not important. They are important, but you also have to be careful and hold them in tension with responsibilities. You quote a number of thinkers and scientists here who have actually advocated perhaps for basically killing people with disabilities or rooting disabilities out of human existence. For example, I've got a quote here from uh, Mary Warnock. This is some of the most highly controversial stuff. I don't think this is representative of a lot of people, but this is something that we need to grapple with when we're thinking of things like euthanasia and other things. She said, if you're demented or you know disabled mentally or whatever, she says, you're wasting people's lives. You're wasting your family's lives. You're wasting the resources of the National Health Service. And she suggested that People with dementia, for example, should perhaps be encouraged to take their own lives. Um, she's not alone in that. We have Richard Dawkins is another scientist who would say, you know, if someone became pregnant with a baby who had Down syndrome, he said, abort it and try again. It would be immoral to bring it into the world if you have the choice. I want to hear your thoughts about these thinkers. Like when you hear those quotes, what happens? Well, it's actually not as uncommon a sentiment as you might think. And the underlying problem for both of these people, although Richard Dawkins is straight, it's difficult to, to have a moral argument if life is meaningless and we're not simply uh, the product of our genes. I'm not quite sure what you would mean by morality in the, in the midst of that. But for both of them, they have an understanding of, of personhood in a quite particular way. 
and it's that you can separate personhood from humanness. And so for Mary Warnock, and at the end of that interview, she says, well, if I ever get dementia, I want somebody to take my own life because I won't be the person that I was. Now, there's two, a couple of things in there. Um, first of all, they work with the concept of personhood separated from humanness, which means that personhood is defined by a series of moral qualities and capacities that mean that you are valid as a person. So that might be rationality, it might be choice, it might be creativity. There's all sorts of ways in which people frame it. If you don't have these or cease to have these qualities, you're no longer a person. If you're no longer a person, you no longer fall under the moral protection of personhood. So therefore, all of these things can happen to you without anybody being particularly morally upset. And you're right, it sounds extreme, but if you think about just sticking with the issue of dementia, the kind of language that people use around dementia, he or she is not the person she used to be, or I rather remember them as the person they were, but who are they? If they're not the person they used to be, who are they and, and why would you love them? Whilst the, it's not as extreme as these people, it's the same sentiment, because implicitly we, we have a similar model of personhood that runs through society. Mm. Most people wouldn't take that to the extreme of, therefore we will kill somebody, that general sense that you have to do something and to remember things or to be something in order to be a person is something that we unconsciously just very often buy into. And so I think it's important to, to watch the way you speak and, and, and be aware of the language that you use around these kinds of issues. And this is why people with disabilities, disability communities are often very opposed to things like euthanasia because they worry about the risks where other people would be making decisions to end life of people who are assumed to either be worthless or too big of a burden or that their existence is – would be miserable or whatever these things are. And I used to feel – it's confession time, right? <laughs> Here's a confession. Uh, bless you, my son. Yes, thank you. I used to feel pretty <laughs> confident that I value human life and I, I was uncomfortable with the idea of – of euthanasia because it would disproportionately affect people with disabilities and it could be used to basically do our own eugenics thing of trying to perfect the human race and so on and so forth. But then I had a personal experience with um, with my mother-in-law who had Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS and watching her body deteriorate over the course of two years was excruciating and we knew – I mean it was terminal. There was no way she would – survive. We knew that. And we also knew the end could be quite grim, that she would effectively suffocate to death eventually. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where she couldn't move anything. She couldn't move her body. She couldn't do anything. She was fully paralyzed. And to her, had lived a life where she hadn't been like that. So she wasn't used to it and she felt trapped. And, and it was really difficult to watch. And I have to admit that at that time, I wondered like, why – why not, in certain instances, allow people to have that choice of saying, I'm in so much pain and I'm ready? I'd like to hear your thoughts about that and, you know, um, your candid thoughts. My mouth, I think, is a really difficult situation. But one of the challenges is that medicine can keep people alive in a way that they never have done in the past. So that you've got an ongoing ethical conversation about what that means. And so I think, you know, I don't have an opinion on your mother-in-law's situation because I don't know that situation. But I do know that severe and horrible as that situation is, and clearly it obviously is, it's not necessarily people who are at that end of, of suffering that a lot of the arguments end up falling upon. So there's a broad range of conditions that come under the, the conversation about euthanasia. And I always think there's a danger in having the moral conversation, I think, of it, simply looking at one extreme. And I don't mean extreme in the sense that it's not important or it's atypical, because it, it is typical for many people. But I think it's important to keep the, the discussion as a whole, looking at, across the board at uh, the way in which people encounter suffering, the way in which people deal with suffering, and what our responses should be. So my, my heart goes out to you in mm. relation to that situation and other people. And, and I think it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation in relation mm. to uh, what the boundaries of medicine are in the context of that kind of extreme suffering. What I realized was just how 
rapidly personal it can all become because mm -hmm. I had been studying disabilities for a while mm -hmm. and had really felt, you know, really strong feelings about opposing things like euthanasia for the sake of protecting people with disabilities. And then seeing my mother-in-law go through that, having a personal direct experience with her really challenged what I felt about it. And you bring up a similar thing in the book with Charles Darwin. Well, there's, there's two people I, I, I raise in, in relation to that, both uh, Charles Darwin and Peter Singer. Charles Darwin, if you read any of his early work, is pretty pretty scathing when it comes to the lives of people with intellectual disabilities. He, he calls them subhuman, he calls them all sorts of things, and clearly he sees them as further down the evolutionary tree. And indeed, he, there's points when he seems to point to other races as reminding him of these other races that are actually further down the, the evolutionary chain, along with people with intellectual disabilities. But then it turns out, it seems, that he had a, a child... Giddens, as you used to call him, like, who had Down syndrome, but some kind of intellectual disability. And he loved that kid. And he played with it, and he, he, he called it, like I say, Giddens. He had this beautiful relationship with him. So at one level, when he's written in his professional capacity, he needs to use, but he actually has to use people with intellectual disability to try and make, it, make the, the points in relation to his, his theories. But in his own life, he loves this guy. And so that tension's there. You see the same tension in the life of Peter Singer. So Peter Singer is notorious for his opinions on ending the lives of people with disabilities. And in his book, Practical Ethics, he lays it all out very clearly. For example, parents should have 28 days after the birth of the disabled child to make a decision whether they want to keep it alive or not. And if, if they decide not, then the, the, the doctor should take the child's life. He says the same thing about people living with Alzheimer's disease. And so it's a very hard line, uh, utilitarian argument. And yet, when his mother had Alzheimer's disease, she, he put her in a really expensive care home. Hmm. And so the tension there is when it hits home for you, it's not the same. And he says this himself. Hmm. He says it's different when it's you. Hmm. Uh, and it is. All of these, uh, an ethical argument is an ethical argument until it becomes part of your life and then it becomes something completely different. Hmm. It's John Swinton. He's a Scottish theologian and chair in divinity and religious studies at the University of Aberdeen. We're talking about his book, Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. So, John, in the next parts of the book, you build a practical theology of time. And just to take a second to define that practical theology, to me, just seems to be theology that applies to everyday life. It's not these high intellectual concepts. It's not parsing out little bits of intellectual doctrine or whatever, but uh, it's a theology that has to be practical and applied to everyday life. Is that a fair description? How would you describe practical theology? Yeah, uh, that's not a bad description at all. I mean, the way I look at it is that practical theology looks at the interface between what we believe and what we live. So it lives in that cultural space between belief and, and experience. And to some extent, it asks the question, uh, so what? So you have this wonderful theological structure here, which tells you lots of intellectual things about God and uh, but then what does that mean for the people of God today? Because God's working today, God's doing things today. How do we understand that doctrinal structure in relation to what's going on today? So so what? It doesn't mean that, that I discount theoretical concepts. I'm quite the opposite. I mean, I'm very keen on them. But I always think if you're going to talk about the revelation of God, it's not just a historical thing. It is a historical thing. It's also a contemporary thing. And practical theology moves between that historical theology and contemporary experience with a view to try and say, discover what God's about at this moment in time. Uh, yeah, so I guess even what I was sort of calling the highfalutin theology could be practical theology when you ask that additional question of so what. So you might have some particular yeah. view of like – how God created humans or something. And it could be very intellectual and very high concept. But if it has practical implications for like how you live every day or what you do, I guess then, yeah, then even that high yeah. up there stuff could be pretty practical theology then. It can be. And I think I mean, one of the problems with the academy is it tends to, to split us all up. You know, so you have mm -hmm. systematic theologians, historical theologians, biblical scholars. I actually think the only way that we can do things well is by dialoguing together, mm -hmm. by, yeah. by being theologians together rather than... The, and so there's a, I think there's lots of good things happening in the academy, but that split within theology isn't healthy. Okay, so with that in mind then, um, you're going to talk about a, a theology of time that includes people with disabilities, and you introduce us to a book by a theologian named Kasuki Koyama, who wrote about the three-mile-an-hour God. There's a very interesting book by Levine called um, The Geography of Time, and he points out that 
across cultures, people understand time differently. So people walk faster in Manhattan than they do in Guatemala because it's a different culture. People are functioning differently, going to different places for different reasons. And so the, the space that you inhabit in the world actually determines the way that you use time. So geography is important for understanding time. Okiyama, long before that book was written, back, he wrote this back in the 60s, wrote a book called uh, The Three Mile an Hour God. Uh, and in it there's an essay called The Three Mile an Hour God. And so he says, Jesus walked at three miles an hour. So Jesus, who is God, walks at three miles per hour. Jesus, who is God, who is love, walks at three miles per hour. So love has its speed and its slow speed. There's something very powerful about that. Love has its speed and its slow. And so he, he urges us to take up the time of Jesus, really, and walk in rhythm with Jesus and see what that looks like. And how do you tie that in then to people with disabilities? Well, because if you've ever spent any time with somebody with a profound intellectual disability or somebody with advanced dementia, then you know that you can go quickly. You need to slow down and you need to take time for those things that the time of the world just can't even see. You need to, to slow down and find that space to be with somebody. And so you don't have any choice. In a world that passes people by, Somebody needs to slow down and spend time with those whom God adores in that sense. And when you do that, interesting things happen. And if you have ever spent time with somebody living with advanced dementia, sometimes there are just moments when you come together and recognise one another in a way that you haven't done at any other point of view. Within the Christian tradition is a spirituality called the sacrament of the present moment. That idea that you slow down and just begin to follow your breath and recognise that every breath is a gift and you begin to live a life of gratitude. When you do that there, you see these things. Now, if you're moving too quickly, you miss them. But if you're, if you're moving slowly, then you begin to see things that you couldn't see at a faster speed. Yeah, and this is where the title of the book, Becoming Friends of Time, to think of time as something relational like that is really interesting. You introduce us to a, a British practical theologian named John Hull, and in his 50s, he lost his sight because of a progressive disease. And you talk about how his, his actual perception of time changed with this new disability. He, he felt like time just expanded. He felt like time sort of, he could be more present to it. I have a quote here from him. He says, most forms of disability mean that many things in life must be done slower. Things take more time. But it's not the things that take the time. It's our bodies that take the time and the time that takes our bodies. Thus, time for the disabled person is neither long nor short. Doing this particular job takes me longer than it takes you. However, if I do not compare myself with you, but just concentrate on the task, then I'm not impatient because I know that this is just how long the task takes. So... This is a person, and you describe several people, introduce us to a lot of people in this book, who experience a change in ability in their lives. And it seems like so many of them have that realization of, of, how, of how time itself changed for them. Becoming friends with time meant to become patient with it and to become acquainted with it in the same way that an eternal God would do that in becoming embodied and walking on a dusty Palestinian road. Yeah, that, that's the other way. And so, when, I mean, one of the interesting things for John Hull is when he lost his sight, he began to realise just how much sighted people colonised the world. Uh, and with that, he, what he means is that you always assume that the only way that you can see the world is by looking at it. And so as soon as somebody has a, a visual impairment, the natural thing to do is try and fix it in that way. That was how he felt when he first became blind. But then he says, once I began to see things differently, I began to see that this world of blindness is different. And so my hands are different. I used to just use them to pick up things and stuff. Now I use them to, to feel the face of my children, to be able to work out what they look like when I can't see them. Sounds are different. Everything's different. And within that context, time is different because you're not looking at your watch. It's not a visual thing. It may be a tactile thing if, if, if you have a braille watch, but even the tactile movement, movement time is different because you know, to touch something is not the same as to look. To look at it, you don't really have to do anything. To touch it, you have to intentionally reach out and engage with that watch or that clock or whatever it is in a way that's different. Like. And so your whole body comes into to play for the simplest things of, of the world. And I think he's saying that, uh, just let time take time. 
and you'll begin to feel the world is different. And as you have worked with people with disabilities and communities with people with disabilities, including some profound intellectual disabilities, in the book you talk about things that you have become more acquainted with in those relationships, aspects of your discipleship that are like gentleness and rest and resistance to to rushing and resistance to to kind of capitalist sort of utilitarian views of people like how is this person useful or not um and are they useful to me or not or you know these type of things you spend a lot of time with that i also just wanted to hear your thoughts about how it's important not to turn people's disabilities into just simple object lessons or to sort of exactly. pedestalize or romanticize what they experience. I think that's crucially important because it's not like I hang around with people with disabilities so that I can learn things and I can be transformed. That does happen, mm -hmm. but then that happens with everybody. Any relationship's the same. I mean, I'm having a conversation with you just now and I'm being transformed by the things that you're saying. The way I, I, I try to think about it is it's, the thing that marks the body of Christ is diversity, not uniformity. And so the idea of normalization or even the idea of what is normal seems to be to be completely transformed by thinking about what Paul means about the body of Christ because there is no norm apart from Jesus. Jesus is the only norm uh, that we aspire to in, in that sense. Like. And so the diversity of experiences that go on within the body of Christ, we're supposed to be listening to each of them and if we don't listen to each of them, then we don't learn. You know, we sometimes ask the question, what does it mean to be human? As if there's just one picture over there that you could look at and say, that's what it is. But actually, being human is a wide range of possibilities. One, one of the things that, that we learn when we're together when, in all of our diversity is how to be human. And to be human is to be together. It's not it's just simply a concept or a set of capacities. It's a, it's a community in that way. That's why I think the idea of instrumentalizing people so that you can get your fix of you know, humility or gentleness whatever, is wrong. What we're saying is that that's part of who we are. We just have to learn that from one another. I love hearing you talk about that vision, the body of Christ and, and all the diverse members. I share it. I, I share that with you. But your book doesn't just, again, it doesn't fall back into cheap romanticization. It, it's not just like a beautiful vision, you also engage with the what you call in one of the chapters, the horror of time, some of the real, real difficulties that, that don't seem to be resolved in this life, that don't seem to be, you know, people can feel estranged from God through some of these things, seeing, uh, witnessing suffering or experiencing suffering. And your book spends some time on acquired brain damage, for example, so people that have had traumatic brain injuries or something that actually changes their personalities. And mm -hmm. you introduce us to one woman who held her own funeral as a result of, of something like this. Most people she don't did. get to hold their own funerals. Maybe describe what happened there. No, <laughs> most people don't know. Well, that's Tonya Wally, the, uh, who's the colleague who, who wrote that chapter with me on, on acquired brain damage. Uh, and she had a car accident a few years ago and got quite significant pardon me, brain damage, which meant, for example, that certain colors or smells or tastes or of things she no longer had. So, you know, sometimes you think about brain damage as simply, I'm a different person. And some, some, some ways that, that's true, but it's sometimes just small things as well as big things. Through this accident, she changed quite significantly in her own eyes and the eyes of her friends. And the way that she dealt with this was, well, she went through quite a lot of therapy to deal with some of the psychological aspects of the change, and that's absolutely as it should be. But at one point in her, her, her journey, she and her congregation, her church community, got together beside a, a river and each person had a handful of uh, rose petals and they all stood there and they began to tell stories about Tonya. And so Tonya would tell stories about herself in the now and in, in the past. Our friends would tell stories about her in the now and in the past. It's a beautiful narrative picture of how she was, how she is, and hopefully how she will be. And so once that had finished and the, the kind of ritual has passed, everybody dropped their petals into the water and the stream washed them away. And that symbolised a new life, which was different from the old life, but not necessarily worse from the old life. And so that ritual... It's like a funeral ritual. It's a rite of passage to move you from one way of being in the world or to a way of, another way of being in the world, or one way when you were in the world to a time when you're no longer in the world. It's like that movement there that it captured. Uh, and I thought that was nice. 
they're just a, just a nice way of recognizing things change, but we're with you. Yeah, and they can build a relationship with this person as they are and also mourn the loss of a person that they were. It doesn't have to be yeah. either or. Yeah. No. I wonder, as a religious person in this book, you don't shy away from critiquing your own tradition here. Has engaging with these ideas challenged your faith at all? No, it's deep in my faith. It hasn't challenged my faith in a sense. Um, well, you know, sometimes we think that faith is a, an intellectual feat. You know, there's something you've got to learn lots of things and think lots of things and be able to really say sort of things. And these are all helpful things. But the writer of the Hebrew says that faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. And when you are with people who have acquired brain damage or people with profound intellectual disabilities, people with dementia, you've got to be sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. You've got to give people that faith in that sense. And so by realising that within myself, that my concept of faith was limited, not necessarily wrong, but just definitely limited, and to see it embodied in my work, in my writing, in my thinking, in my experiences with my friends, uh, shifted my faith to, I think it's probably, it's more embodied, it's more real, it's more open to intellectual humility, whereby I recognise there's some things I just don't know. And that comes to my relationships, it comes to what I know about God, it comes to what I know about faith. And I'm comfortable with that because to be humble with your intellect is to avoid the uh, tree of knowledge. I can certainly re relate to that. Um, and, and as you critique Christianity in this book, what's an example of a common Christian understanding of disability that you'd like to challenge and perhaps see change in people's minds? Well, I, I don't so much critique Christianity as critique particular ways of thinking about uh, how we come to know Jesus. Uh, and the problem is that if we are completely focused in on you have to know certain things and you have to be able to articulate certain things about the, the faith before you can be part of the faith, then you automatically exclude not only a lot of people with brain damage and, and intellectual disabilities, but also anybody who who forgets things. So you, Blair, could be a disciple at the top of the stairs you tumble down and by the time you get to the bottom and you've got brain damage and you can't remember anything and can't, you can't say the things that your, your tradition wants you to say, you're no longer a disciple. So that seems to me to make very little sense. I mean, may I hope that God doesn't function in that way and I, I don't have any indication that that would be the case. And so beginning to think about the importance of tradition, the importance of beliefs and the importance of, of intellect, but also recognising that actually faith is more embodied in that sense and that but Bonhoeffer says this quite nicely. Bonhoeffer says that when Matthew is called by Jesus, he didn't know who Jesus was. He says, well, you could, you know, you could imagine that he'd heard the stories or he actually did know because his friends had told him. But before you can say that, you have to go beyond the text. The text doesn't say that. So Bonhoeffer says, Jesus called, Matthew followed. And the interesting thing about Matthew and all the disciples is that all the way through their ministry, they didn't really know who Jesus was, but they were still called disciples. And so the, the idea that you are kind of have problems cognating certain things doesn't necessarily prevent you from being a disciple. You know, love is an embodied emotion, it's a feeling, it's part of a community. It's quite possible to communicate love without having to actually articulate in that. So that expands my imagination a little bit in a way that helps me to understand God more fully, but also to understand how I should be with my brother and sister uh, who uh, live with disabilities. I hope that people, as they listen to this discussion or as they read the book, can come to, to feel a little more aware of that pressure of time and how time affects how we think about people with disabilities and how we think about disabilities itself. I think this is an invaluable aspect of the work that you're doing is to call our attention mm -hmm. to how time and our expectations of time lead us to value things in certain ways. I mentioned my mother-in-law. One of the things that was difficult for her as she was dying was that she felt she felt she had lost all of her usefulness. Like being able to do stuff was so yeah. important to her it, that losing those abilities was excruciating where – I regretted so much this sense of her feeling like she was a burden on us or that it was such a problem. I wish she never had to go through those things to begin with, obviously, but I also wish that she didn't have mm -hmm. to worry about that sense of, of uselessness. And your work on time, I think, can take us a long way toward seeing time a different way. You're inviting us 
to engage in timefulness, timefulness. Do you have any practical advice for people about how to be a little more timeful? Many of us work in a kind of highly pressured work environment, for example. And the question is, how do we do that? I mean, it's, it's quite interesting because in some of the research we do on health and social care, you'll go along to an institution or a, a, a care home and we'll talk about spirituality and everybody say, yeah, it's fantastic. It's a really important thing. And some people will say it's, it's the essence of what a human being is. And then you talk about the practicality and people say, oh, yeah, we haven't got time to do it. And so if you haven't got time to do something, it's, it's the essence of a human being, then you have a problem, a structural problem with the way things are. Now, how do you deal with that? Well, I also think, you know, when the people of Israel were being oppressed and definitely being put under time poverty, when they're going through all that suffering, one of the things that God gave to them was Sabbath, which is a pretty, pretty unusual thing because you expect them to send in angels or send in warriors, but he gives them Sabbath. He says, take this space and think about me. Uh, and there's something really profound about that as well. Take that space and think about me. So I want to think it's, one way we should become timeful people in a busy environment is by thinking about creating Sabbath moments in the midst of the business of our day, where we just take the space and think about me, which means stepping out for a few seconds, thinking about what you're doing, and then stepping back in with fresh eyes. It doesn't take a lot of time. And there's some interesting research done on what's called micro breaks, which uh, indicates that if people are working in a pressured environment, just get two or three minutes from time to time to step out, they step back in, they're, more, they're actually more productive, um, but they, they definitely see things better. So getting into that habit of finding Sabbath moments, just, just times where you can step back, breathe, step back in. Now, you can do that in a highly pressurised environment, but it's probably a good practice for all of us to do, just mm. when, when we get so immersed in things, when everything just humming along under the hood, we can't see things properly, step back out, step back in. Mm. That's John Swinton, a Scottish theologian and author of the book, Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. And he's chair in divinity and religious studies at the University of Aberdeen. All right, John, we're going to take a brief break and come back for our final question. It's going to be our best book segment. I hope you brought something good for people. So we will be right back after this. I've got some incredible news. This is Blair Hodges. We're taking a break for a second throwing another log on the fire. And I just wanted to say we've sold a mug. We finally sold a fireside mug to somebody other than myself. So thank you, Charlotte. That is fantastic. I hope that you enjoy all of the things that you drink from your mug, from your, from your fireside mug. Those mugs and other stuff like hoodies and t-shirts and whatnot is available at the Fireside shop at firesidepod.org. Uh, let's look at some of the reviewers. People have sent in reviews. I kind of have a backlog of these. I need to catch up here. Let's let's dive right in. So Randolph the Gray, Randolph the Gray, uh, who joins me on Instagram Live sometimes when I read frog and toad stories, uh, gave us five stars. Somebody called thinks I'm an all around cool guy. Uh, we have C Star thirty five, Jacob three two two. Someone oh, J <laughs> Jacob says uh, you're gonna love this show if you love Joe Rogan. I <laughs> horrified, horrified at that. <clears throat> I will say no more. Um, someone called First 5K left a review. DP Roberts 55 says that the show is like chatting with an old friend, but this time by a fire. Uh, thank you. Someone called, he calls me Shell. This is a stay at home mom who says she's hungry for in depth conversations and that this show is a joy. Um, that's great. I love spending time with, with people uh, who are looking to scratch that intellectual uh, and spiritual itch. Someone called Charles Irish gave us a review. David Osler. Keith left a review. Uh, Keith is the host of a new podcast called That All Might Be Edified. He left a five-star review. Uh, thank you for that. E. Corbridge said that the show lights a fire inside. And we have a review from Tim Robison. And we have one from that one guy from there. And he says he loves the show, but he doesn't think the theme song fits the rest of the show. Well, I mean, I love the theme song, Faded Paper Figures. Uh, but stick around. I mean, if we get to season two, there might be some cool new stuff to keep things fresh. Who knows? Uh, my dear friend Tracy M left a five star review. Thanks for that. Hi, Tracy. Megalodon 16, Ashley Clem, John Blogden. I, I feel like I've said John Blogden before, but maybe not. Um, M. Thee Thee Lee Lay Lee. <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't know who that is. Uh, but thank you. Rachel Ann, Kirk Lester, Wendy Sund, Andy BLV, Jacqueline Sokol. Uh, shout out to Jacqueline. has been a long time friend. And I, I don't, maybe I've mentioned you before, Jacqueline. I'm, maybe I forgot to cross your name off here. Um, Eidolon House and Soaps by B. I think that's good. We're catching up here. But all of those people left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for doing that. I also noticed that Spotify added uh, rating possibilities. You can't leave a written review, but if you're listening on Spotify, you can give a one through five star review. So go ahead and check that out if you're listening on Spotify. All right, anyways, one other point of order. I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Patrick Mason and his podcast, The Foyer. This podcast is from the Leonard J. Arrington chair up at Utah State University. And The Foyer is conversations about Mormon history and culture. So. You're going to hear from people like Lori Maffley Kipp and Marlon Jensen and Nylon McBain and other people who have done research on Mormonism. So if you're into Latter-day Saint stuff, if you're a Mormon listener, this is a really great show. And I, and I love the name, The Foyer. It's, you know, this is in, in Latter-day Saint church buildings. This is the place outside the congregation area where you kind of go to chat and catch up with people and socialize and uh, you know some of the best conversations and Sunday school lessons have probably been taught in the foyer so that's a great name but uh, this is great you're going to hear from people inside and outside Mormonism talking about Mormon history culture and theology uh, they're on a bit of a break right now but they've got a nice back catalog of a number of episodes here maybe a dozen or so that you can catch up on um, you can check out the foyer just wherever podcasts are found and uh, it's also by the way part of the dialogue podcast network as this show is okay that was a little bit longer than usual but thanks for sticking around and let's get back to it with john swinton this is fireside with blair hodges <music> We're back with John Swinton, author of the book, Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. Okay, John, we're going to turn the time over to you. It is best books time. What did you bring for us? Well, one of my favorite books uh, recently has been a book on the crucifixion by Fleming Rutledge. It's just a fascinating exposition and exploration into the meaning of uh, the crucifixion, both in terms of its historicity, but also in terms of what it means for us today. And she's a preacher, and so she spent all of her life preaching and teaching. Like, and it's it's a huge book. It's a big book. It must be about six hundred pages or something. And it's just the fruits of a, a lifetime lived preaching the gospel. But it's not like a big, thick academic book that, that you know that you get into four pages and you think, oh, I can't be bothered. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's actually quite riveting. It'll take you a little while to get through it, but it's great. And it's one of these books I like is it's, it's thick with knowledge, but also thick with contemplation. And you feel you're a better person for reason. <laughs> so that's, 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 my, that's my book at the moment. Cool. Well, John, yeah. is there anything that you're working on now? Um, we're we're a few years removed. I should. I want people to know too. We actually met once, and I don't. You. I'm sure you don't remember this either. But we were at a conference on disability and religion. I do remember. Yeah, you do. I do. You signed it, and I told you back then. I was like, I'm going to interview yeah. you someday, and it's been <laughs> like five years or something. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Takes time. Good things take time. Time takes time. Yeah. <laughs> time takes time. <laughs> well, what are what are you working on now? What are you up to? Well, I just I had a book out last year called Finding Jesus in the Storm, which is focusing on the spiritual experiences of people with mental health challenges. That was very interesting. It's, a, it's mm. based on a, a series of sixty odd interviews I did with people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mm. and major depression. So that, that's been out, and it's, it's, it seems to be helping people. I just finished a, a, a book, roughly titled. A little book on evil and how to avoid it. And so years ago, I wrote a book on evil. And I felt I had some things to say. And now I wish I hadn't because evil is really depressing. <laughs> so <laughs> never write a book on evil. <laughs> I don't know why I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you like, you wrote a book on time, and time started closing in on you. You wrote a book on evil, and oh. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Cool. So I'm just finishing that off just now, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Good. Well, I look forward to it, John. I, I want to thank you for coming on Fireside. This has been a really great conversation. No, it's a pleasure. It's been really nice to see you again. Fireside with Blair Hodges is sponsored by the Howard W. Hunter Foundation, supporters of the Mormon Studies Program at Claremont Graduate University in California. And it's also supported by the Dialogue Foundation, a proud part of the Dialogue Podcast Network. I hope you enjoyed this discussion today. Thanks for being here at Fireside. This is a bring your own refreshments situation, but you're welcome to continue the conversation online. You can join me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Pod Fireside, and I'm on Facebook too. You could also leave a comment at the website, firesidepod.org. 
If you don't know where to review the show, Apple Podcasts is the main place. But you can always just click on an episode on the website and scroll down past the transcript, the full written transcript of each episode, by the way. You're going to see a comment section there. So you can just leave a comment on the website. And as I mentioned earlier, Spotify listeners can rate shows too. So you can do that there. You can also email me questions, comments, or suggestions to Blair at firesidepod.org. That is the address. And if you've recommended this show to a friend, I want to say thanks sincerely because that's how we grow this audience. We can only do it together. Uh, tell your mom, tell your dad uh, <laughs> that this show is super rad. Fireside's recorded, produced, and edited by me, Blair Hodges, in Salt Lake City. Special thanks to my production assistant, Kate Davis, who created the transcript. And also thanks to Christy Franson, Matthew Bowman, Caroline Klein, and Kristen Ulrich Hodges, as usual. Our theme music is by Faded Paper Figures. Thanks for joining me at Fireside with Blair Hodges. It's a place to fan the flames of our curiosity about life, faith, and culture together. We'll see you next time. Thank you.